Let us pray. Our great God in heaven, we thank you once again for bringing us to our Bible study today. Thank you for those who are waiting and eager to learn the word of God. Lord, we pray you make us to be doers of the word we learn in Jesus' name. Now read and do, learn and do, hear and do. That Lord, the emphasis will be that by your grace, by the power of your spirit, will be doers of the word in Jesus' name. Once again, Lord, we're asking that you open our eyes of understanding so that we understand what you require from us in your word. And then the grace, the desire, the willingness, the faithfulness to follow, you grant to everyone. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We're looking at First Thessalonians 3D from chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, we're looking at verses 7 through to verse 12. In verse 7, For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despises, despises not man, but God, who has also given unto us his Holy Spirit, but as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. In verse 11, that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business. And to walk with your own hands, as we commanded you, that she may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that she may have lack of nothing. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to our hearts in Jesus' name. As we look at verse 7, the apostle tells us the very heart of God, the might of the Lord, concerning you, concerning me, concerning us, concerning the whole church, concerning this church and every other church in every generation. It talks about the calling of the Lord. Look at verse 7. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but he has called us unto holiness. As we look at the Bible, we find that the believer's call is a high calling that you find in Philippians 3.14. Not only a high calling, it's also a holy calling that you'll find in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9. And then number 3, it is a heavenly calling. Hebrews 3 verse 1. That's why we're looking at this passage. And we're titled it, The Believer's High, Holy, and Heavenly Calling. As we think about the calling of God, and you think about what God can do, and what call the Lord can give, and a kind of invitation he can give to you and to me, and to everyone that names the name of the Lord. The call of God has to be according to his nature, according to his purpose, according to his will. All sinners are unclean by nature, they are unclean by choice, they are unclean by practice. Man does not need a call to uncleanness. Nobody needs an encouragement to be unclean. We're naturally unclean. By choice, we're unclean. Without any commandment, without any counseling, without any call, without any encouragement, without any assistance from anybody, everybody is unclean. Therefore, we don't need any call to uncleanness. The call we need is to come out of defilement, out of darkness, out of evil, out of sin, out of depravity, and then to come into the righteousness and the holiness of the Lord. That's why it says in verse 7, for God has not called us. He cannot. There's no way the Lord can call us unto uncleanness, but he has called us unto Holiness. God cannot call us to uncleanness because his nature is opposed to uncleanness. Rather, he calls us from the cesspool of sin and degradation. Uncleanness makes man dirty and defiled, brings condemnation and judgment, associates man with unclean spirits. So we'll spend eternity in the lake of fire, in the blackness of darkness forever and ever. But the Lord then calls us 
And when we turn to the Lord and respond to his call, when we repent and turn to the Lord, he cleanses us, he forgives us, he saves us and lifts us up. And through Christ, he delivers us from the present evil, defiled world according to the will of God. God is of purer eyes than to behold evil. That's the reason why he's not calling us to uncleanness. He cannot. He calls us to righteousness. He calls us to holiness. He calls us to purity of heart and life. God's call then is high. Why is it high? Because it demands and enables us to come up higher. His call is holy. Why is it holy? Because it gives us transformation to become partakers of his holiness. Not only that, his call is heavenly. Because he purifies us and prepares us for eternal glory, eternal fellowship with him on high in heaven. I want you to notice something. That when God calls, many people limit the call of God. They just say, yes, we're holy. And just like we learned last week, we're holy for a purpose. We're sanctified for a purpose. And we come out of the world for a purpose. I want you to see the calling of God. He calls us to holiness. But the reason is why. The question is why. We're looking at John chapter 17. I'm reading there from verse 16. John chapter 17 verse 16. I'm going to read 16, 17 and 18. But I'm going to do something. I read verse 16. I read verse 18. I want you to make the necessary connection in your heart, in your life. And I want you to understand what the call of the Lord is and the reason he gives us that call. Look at John chapter 17 verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Come down to verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. You know, there are people that dwell and remain and reside in verse 16. They are not of the world. Just like I am not of the world. And they say, thank the Lord we are saved. Thank the Lord we are separated from the world. Thank the Lord we are holy. Thank the Lord we are pure. Thank the Lord we are sanctified. We are not of the world. He cleanses us. Makes us holy. Then he sends us back to that world. And he says, as the Father has sent me into the world, even so I send them into the world. He's telling us then that holiness is for a purpose. Sanctification is for a purpose. Purity of heart and purity of life is for a purpose. The reason why the Lord has saved you is so that you may help in saving others. The reason why God has called you into holiness is so that you will help in being a tremendous call, encouragement to other people to come out of their sin, out of their evil, out of their dirt and defilement and come into holiness. So look at verse 17 and join that with verse 18. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As you come here, you hear the word of God. As you come here, you learn the word of God. As you come and you read the word, you meditate on the word, you're pure, you're clean through the word which has spoken unto you. The power of the word, the water that washes and purifies and sanctifies us. But please remember, immediately after verse 17, it goes to verse 18. And then he said, after sanctifying them, after purifying them, in verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even even so, have I also sent them into the world. That makes it very clear then that sanctification is not in isolation by itself. And the sanctified brother, the sanctified sister, the sanctified child of God is not in isolation by himself, by herself. You're sanctified so that you'll be sent into the world now that you're clean. Now that you're pure, now that you're holy, to be able to go and tell other people there is a high calling. Tell other people there is a holy calling. Tell other people there is a heavenly calling and the Lord uses your life and uses your voice and uses your gift and uses your talent to call other people to a life of repentance, righteousness, holiness, and sanctification. As we look at the study tonight, we're looking at it under three perspectives. Number one, God's unchanging call to holiness. That means from the time of creation to the time of recreation. That means from the old covenant to the new covenant. The call of God has not changed because his nature has not changed. 
Because his desire has not changed. And because his word has not changed. And because the condition of getting to heaven has not changed. And because the condition of being in fellowship with God here on earth and also in eternity, that condition has never changed. Will never change. That's why it says it is God's unchanging call to holiness. Number two, the great unchangeable commandment from heaven. When a commandment is not just coming from the earth, it's not coming from a religion just group. It's not coming from a seminary. It's not coming from theologians. It's not coming from a denomination. It's coming from heaven. And that commandment that is coming from heaven is unchangeable. There is no theologian that can rise up today and say, I become wiser than God. And I'm saying now it's no more necessary. That's what some theologians are doing. They pretend to be wiser than God, greater than God. They pretend to be able to know the way to heaven more than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But not to mind them on the final day, they'll find that they have deceived themselves and they'll see many other people. And then their place will be away from the Almighty God. But as we believe the Word of God, we learn the Word of God, we're learning that this commandment from heaven is great as well as unchangeable. The great, unchangeable commandment from heaven. Number three, the glorious, uncompromising commitment to honesty. If we are holy, we're going to be honest. If we are holy, we're going to be faithful. If we are holy, we're going to be fair. If we are holy, we're going to be just. If we are holy, we're going to have a fair deal in business, in work, in relationship, in interaction with everybody else. If we are holy, there will be no shady dealing. If we are holy, there will be nothing we're hiding or a skeleton in the cupboard. That's why it says the consequence of being holy is that we will be honest. God's uncompromising commitment or the glorious uncompromising commitment to honesty. We're coming back to number one. Number one once again is God's unchanging call to holiness. By that word unchanging, we're saying that in every dispensation from Adam to Abraham, from Abraham to Moses, from Moses to David, and from David to Isaiah, and from Isaiah to Malachi, and from Matthew, the Gospels, to the Acts of the Apostles, and from the Acts to the Epistles, and then to the final day when the Lord will call us home, that calling of God remains the same. That means from denominations of churches in the past, as we begin from the first church and then come into this final day, final time now, when the charismatics and the Pentecostals are rising up, that every time, whatever the denomination, whatever the church, it's God's unfailing, unchanging call, and that call is high, that call is heavenly, that call is holy, and it is called to holiness. So coming back to 4 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. It says in verse 7, For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. When you look at that word us, it means, you know, Paul the Apostle was writing along with Timothy and Silas. He said, myself and Timothy and Silas, those of us who are leaders, those of us who are preachers, those of us who are evangelists and apostles, God has not called us unto uncleanness and he has not called us unto defilement, unto sin. He has called us unto holiness. Now he talks about the church to us, church. Thessalonian church, I identify with you. The same calling the Lord has given me, he has given unto you. And it says, we who are Christians who name the name of the Lord, God has not called us unto uncleanness. He has called us unto holiness. Now it's talking about the church everywhere now, Galatia and Corinth and Philippi and Ephesus, it said the whole church, the whole body of Christ at that time and at this time and until the end of the age, God has not called called us unto uncleanness. He has called us unto holiness. And then he goes to verse 8. He says, he therefore that despises. You know, many people will think it's only in these days we have scorners and scoffers. 
Many people will think that only in these days that we have people that reject the word of God. They hear the word of God being preached and coming by inspiration from God direct from heaven. And yet they will despise. And you know, some people say, oh, the good old days. I wish I had lived in the time of the apostles when everybody just accepted the word of God at face value. But all the apostles said, no. We also have some detractors among us too in the early church. And it says there were people that they kind of derided the word of God, belittled the word of God, despised the word of God. But he told them that anyone that despised was not despising the preacher, was not despising the apostles. Anyone despising the word, the word of his grace, the word of repentance, and the word of righteousness, and the word of holiness. He said, he that despises, despises not man, but God who has also given unto us his Holy Spirit. That will tell you the final end of such people, the people that despise the almighty God, a creator and redeemer, and the one that is preparing us to live eternally with him. He that despises, or she that despises, that feels is going to change the word of God and change the mind of God, and is trying to be wiser than God, saying, God, that cannot be. Nobody can be holy. We reject holiness. It says, if you reject holiness, you are despising the Almighty God, and you are despising the Spirit of God, and you are despising Christ who shed his blood so that we can be pure and holy and sanctified. It says, if you despise like that, what will your end be? Now, this call is unchanging. I told you from the past unto the present unto the future is the demand of the almighty God and I pray that as this is unchanging our church will never change. Will not drop the word of holiness and then be running after bread and butter and then be running after the things that do not profit. This is the very center of the will of God and this is the very center of ministry. And the very center, the very heart of the matter, we're not going to drop, we'll never drop for any reason in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen if you're still there. In Leviticus chapter 20, I'm reading from verses 7 and 8. It's very important for you to stress this in your mind. And to the line each in your mind because you know many churches are rising up, denominations are rising up, ministries are rising up, and fellowships are rising up. And if there's anything you know they do, I'm, I'm sure you'll find them in your community. I'm sure you'll find them where you have come from. They despise the word of holiness. All they are running after is uh, maybe some uh, temporary blessings of life. They'll fast, they'll they pray, they go to the mountain top, they'll go to the valley, they'll go to the riverside, they go anywhere, they'll do anything. They even travel to Jerusalem just to seek whatever they're seeking. But holiness is not part of what they're seeking. They despise that. And the Lord is saying, he that despises, despising this unchanging word of God, unchanging truth, eternal truth, is not despising man, it's despising God. I pray God will deliver us from them in Jesus' name. In Leviticus chapter 20 verse 7, Leviticus 20 verse 7, sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy for I am the Lord your God he's saying I'm calling you to holiness because I have the authority I'm your creator I am the Lord your God I'm calling you to holiness because I have the right I have the right over your life I am your redeemer I am the one who has saved you and I brought you near unto myself because I am the Lord I call you to holiness and he says sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy look at verse 8 and ye shall keep my statutes and do them he shall keep my statutes. The reason why the Lord has given us his word is not to argue with the word. Do them. It's not to debate the word. Do them. It's not to despise the word. Do them. It's not to kind of, uh, you know, put your opinion above the word. It says do them. It's not to reason why. Why should this be? Why should that be? You know, there are people that toss, uh, you know, the word of God up and down. Is it head or tail? The people that argue with the word of God. The people that, you know, they try to say that, you know, if our children are not following, are we not going to change the word? and love our children more than the word of God. There's some people that will think hey, the sinners in the world. You know, you're sinners in the world. They're not coming to the church. And because they're not coming, shouldn't we change the world so that the sinners will come to the church? You see, are you going to exalt the sinners above God? 
and despise the word of God because sinners who are depraved and who are blind who are deaf, who are hardened because those sinners will not yield are you going to despise the word of God because of that? Noah the preacher of righteousness and holiness preached for 120 years and only his family of seven people with him age believed 120 years and Noah did not think well God what are we going to do I'm building this gigantic ark and there's a lot of space there but the people are not coming Don't we change the word of God so that the people will come. He says, don't you do that. Because I testify to every one of you that whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and shall add unto them. He says, the Lord will add the plagues unto you. And whosoever will read the words of this prophecy and then take away it will take away the word of holiness, the doctrine of holiness, the doctrine of sanctification. Because, you know, people don't want that today. They don't love that today. Whosoever shall take away from the words of this prophecy, God shall take his part out of the book that he has written and out of the holy city. I pray God will not take us away from the book of life. But you know, if you kind of argue with the word and debate the word and toss the word aside because you're trying to adjust the word to suit yourself, suit your family, suit your children, suit everybody around you so that they'll be able to come into religion, not into the kingdom. It says, if you take away the Lord, will take your part out of the word and out of the book of life. I pray that you'll stay faithful to the very end in Jesus' name. You shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. He'll sanctify us. Thank God he has done it already. I say thank God he has done it already. I know he has done it for me. I believe he's doing it for you. We're looking at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 14. As obedient children. What kind of children? Argumentative children. Debating children. Careless children, the children that despise their father. What kind of children? Yes. Which one are you? Yes. Praise the Lord. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former laws in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. That tells us then that this call is unchanging. I read it to you far back in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 20. And now I'm reading far on in the New Testament in First Peter. And the calling is still the same. It's unchanging. The nature of God is unchanging. The demand of God is unchanging. And because it's according to the will of God and the purpose of God and the nature of God, this is unchanging. It's God's unchanging call to holiness. And as the Lord is calling you, I pray that you'll be like that in Jesus' name. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. What has called us to. What has called us to. And the Lord is saying, this is it. This is it. And we're not going to take any jot or title out of the word of God. We're going to abide in the word of God and abide by the word of God in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 12. We're looking at verse 14. For no peace with all men and tell me what? holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It says follow peace, follow peace. Don't just follow healing, follow deliverance. Don't just follow this kind of fashion and that kind of fashion. Don't just follow the ideas of men, the theology of men. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That's impossible. I said we are born again. And as you know why many churches where they are not talking about holiness because they're not preaching the new birth. They're not preaching being born again. And the power of conversion, the power of transformation is not working in the lives of the people. And since all the people are wayward and callous and careless and they're sinful, then we want to accommodate the word of God into preaching the word of God according to the careless lives of the people that are coming to church. I do not know the Lord. But as we see that we cannot do this in our strength, in our power, it takes the strength of the Lord and the power 
power of the Lord. And if anything is going to change, it's the people that have to change. Not the word of God. The word of God will not change. The people will have to change. Is that right? I said, is that right? If anything has to change, it will be. God will not change. It's the creature that will change. It's the sinner that will change. It's the church that is not living according to the word of God that will change. Not God, not his word. His word remains and abides forever. And that unchanging word declares, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I want you to think about that, no man, no man. Let's start from the preachers, no man, no preacher. No man, no pastor, without holiness, no minister will see the Lord. How we need to be compassionate on these ministers that are running up and down and they are sweating and they are sacrificing and they are fasting and they are doing everything. And we need to quietly go to them, respectfully go to them and say, Sir, we appreciate your sacrifice, we appreciate your running up and down, we appreciate your traveling here and there. But sir, just to remind you, take care of your life too. Take care of your experience too. Because without holiness, sir, no man, no minister shall say the Lord. And we need to help our workers. Workers in all places. Workers in all churches. And say, workers, with all due respect, we love you. We appreciate you. How you sacrifice, how you spend time, how you give money, how you do a lot of things. Just for the work of the Lord. I hope it's the work of the Lord, the work of the kingdom. I hope it's not just denominational duty. Because worker. Without holiness, no man, no worker shall see the Lord. I want you to tell people who are coming to our church and they say, I'm a member of this church and praise the Lord. I've been in this church for many years now and I don't ever plan leaving this church. I'm born again in this church. I will die in this church. Praise the Lord for such commitment. But can I please tell you that even if you sleep in this church without holiness, Nobody claiming to be a member of the church will see the Lord. I would need to tell the people that, you know, they've been coming to our church now. They try to change their dressing. They put up this, they put up that. But that's just outward change. The heart is not changed. The mind is not changed. The lifestyle is not changed. They're still fighting their husbands at home, still beating their wives at home. And they're still naughty and evil and they're rebellious against the word of God. I would need to tell them. Coming to church is good because it makes us hear the word of God. But church comer, church goer, we do remember that you need to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Uh, the best thing we can do for people who are coming to the church. Thank God for those who come for the first time. And you say, now, this is my first time of coming. And if there's anything we can tell those who are coming, we say, thank God you have come. The doors of the church are open to you. But as you come, you don't just sit down. And don't just say, well, I'm part of this church now. Get on your knees. Turn away from sin. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that the peace of God will come in your heart. And then the people you have been having some disagreements and fighting and conflict, you go and settle over them because you need to follow peace with all men. And then after you are saved, you keep on seeking the Lord until he sanctifies and purifies you. For without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. I pray that this truth will be emphasized by the Holy Spirit himself in every heart in Jesus name look at verse 15 there it says looking diligently because if we don't look diligently if we're not very serious to keep what we have there's something there wanting to take days away from you looking diligently let any man fail of the grace of God let any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one muscle of meat sold his birthright. Now, can you think of anybody exchanging a single plate of food, plate of food, with birthright, with the blessing of Abraham? Can you think of people that will exchange five minutes of pleasure of the flesh? with eternal glory, with heaven. There are people that do that just a night to fulfill the loss of the flesh. Just a night in fornication. Just a night in adultery. Just that. 
just one night and then they lose eternal glory, eternal heaven. And the Lord is saying, don't be that foolish, be wise and think about eternity and don't allow any temporary thing to take eternal life away from you. I will not lose this grace thing I've got. I said, I will not lose what I've got. You will not lose it in Jesus' name. For ye know that after watch, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. The Lord is telling us not to despise this great sin the Lord has given us, but to retain it. You are going to retain it. And retain it to the very, very end until you breathe your last here on earth. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 28. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28. He that despiseth Moses' law died without mercy. Under two or three witnesses, he's talking about the people that despise the word of holiness. He said, don't you remember that those who despise the law of Moses, they died without mercy? If we despise then this important doctrine of sanctification, if we despise then this important teaching of holiness, it says, what is the hope for us? Because it says, of how much sorrow punishment, suppose he, shall he be thought worthy, who has trodden down on the foot the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace, for ye know him that has said vengeance belongeth unto me i will repay i will recompense the lord and again the lord shall judge his people everybody wants to go verse 31 read that again once you go now read it as if you really believed it It's a fearful thing for anybody to despise the word of God and just carelessly, you know, take the Lord Jesus Christ for granted and then despise this inspired eternal word of God and turn it, just push it aside and reject it and despise the preaching of holiness and sanctification. What a fearful thing awaits such a person because it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We're looking at number two now, the great unchangeable commandment from heaven. We're coming to First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm reading from verses 9 and 10. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. He said, now we're talking about the result of that holiness. We're talking about the result of that sanctification. Actually, you'll understand the reason why God sanctifies us, the reason why God purifies us is so that we love him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, and then we love our neighbors as ourselves. He says, therefore, the consequence of that sanctification and the result of that sanctification and the result of that purity of heart is so that now there is no hindrance to your love. There is no hindrance to your relationship with God and relationship with people around you, you are now able to love. He says, he sanctifies us. He purifies us. And then he teaches us how to love him, how to love the brethren, how to love our neighbors. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And see the consequence. The consequence of being sanctified and being holy. And the consequence of being purified in the heart is so that we'll be able to love God and love one another. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. It says the reason of that circumcision of heart and the reason for that sanctification of purity of heart and the reason for that holiness is so that we'll be able to love God and he who loves God will love his neighbor also. Come back to First Thessalonians chapter 4. Verses 9 and 10. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of 
God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. And the thing the apostle Paul was praising the Lord for is that the ministry of the word had been productive and fruitful in the lives of these Thessalonian believers. I want to remind you that these people are converted people. They turned away from idol to serve the true and the living God. I want to remind you that after their conversion, they began to tell other people. They began to evangelize and tell other people how they too can repent and come to know the Lord. After their conversion, they began to prepare their lives for the coming of the Lord, waiting for the coming of the Lord. After their conversion, they began to show some respect and honor to the apostle that had brought the word of God unto them. After their conversion, they began to prepare themselves so that they would live the life that will make God happy, that will please the Lord, and that will also rejoice the heart of the preacher of Paul the apostle. And now he says, I'm so sure about you because you are taught of God. You are taught of God to love one another. And he says, now I want you to do it more and more verse 10 latter part of verse 10 but we beseech you brethren that she increase more and more it says don't be satisfied with what you've got don't just rest because of what you've got go ahead and do it more more and more and you've done it in macedonia do it in more places You've done it to those people, they do it to more people. You've done it in this way, do it in more ways, more and more. And I pray that that love will increase in your life, in my life, in our lives together in Jesus' name. We're looking at John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. John chapter 13, verse 34. Here is telling us a new commandment I give unto you that she love one another as I have loved you. He said, I pray for you that you'll get sanctified, you'll be purified, you'll be made holy, your heart holy, your mind holy, your thoughts holy, your interaction holy, your conversation holy. And then as a result of that new covenant, and as a result of the thing that the God is going to do in your life through the coming of the new covenant, which Christ is going to effect on Calvary. I give you a new commandment then, love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this they shall all men know that ye are my disciples. Tell me the rest. If you have loved one to another, by day shall all men know. Uh, you know, I've been emphasizing for a long time now, and I hope you get it, but maybe you've not got it, you'll get it now, that it's not by our dressing. It's not by our dressing. It's good to dress nice and not to wear this, not to wear that. That's all right. That's good. That's good. That's the word of God to you. But it's by your love by your love, by this love, sincere love, transparent love, a love without any ulterior motive, a love that is constant, a love that you're on the mountain, you love, you're in the valley, you love, whatever is happening, rainy day, you love, sunny day, you love, and that's the thing, that Christ, the Christ of God, and the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, lives in your heart, and God is love, and then because of that constant manifestation of love, by they shall all men know that she are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. I'm sure you know some ladies, they always wear their scarf, but you know, they have anger in the heart, they have bitterness in the heart, they have malice in the heart, they have jealousy in their mind. I'm sure you know about those uh, brothers that they dress the old fashioned way. And I'm a Christian, I'm a member of deeper life. And look at my dressing, and the jealousy is there in the heart, and the bitterness and the hatred is there in the heart. And you cannot live with them. They are men of conflict and men of war. And it says it's not by your dressing. It's not by saying hallelujah, praise the Lord. I'm a member of deeper life. And some people want us to wear some kind of badge. And put some stickers on our cars, on our vehicles. I am deeper. You know, they, you know, they go around with all those stickers. It's not by the sticker. By the love you have. Love towards God and love towards man. By this shall all men know. That she are my disciples, if we have love one to another, I pray that this will be in us. In John chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 12. John 15, verse 12. 
In John chapter 15 verse 12, this is my commandment. It's not was, it's not will be, it's the present tense. It is the commandment of the Lord. It says that she love one another as exactly as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. It says the kind of love I have is to lay down my life for my friends, for my disciples, for you, for everyone. And it says that's the kind of love I want you to have. What are you laying down? Something so precious to you. Can you lay that down for the church, for the brethren, for the people of God? Are you the one that is always grabbing, always holding, always keeping? This is mine. This is mine. I'd rather trample on other people so you can keep what you think belongs to you. You want to keep that privilege and keep that position and keep that property and keep that money and keep that word and keep whatever it is you are keeping and keep that job and keep that company and then you don't worry to push down other people. He said, hey, that's not love. That's not love. You love property more than life. It's like the people of the world. They love politics more than life. They don't worry. They can get all those thugs to kill, to destroy, to scatter everything so they can get position. They love position more than life. They can shed blood and sacrifice and sacrifice human beings so that they can have a position. And if you come to the church and you come to a born again and then you love position more than life and you love authority more than life and you love whatever it is more than he said that's not right you lay down your life to show that you love it says greater love has no man than this but that he laid down his life for his friends you know some people they even find it difficult to lay down tithes and offering to give one tenth of their income they love money so much and they find it difficult to lay down their land for the church to be built there they love land more than eternal life or you say, house they have, we cannot even have house fellowship there. Or they say, I care for my house, my house is neat. I don't want any kind of people wearing slippers and wearing all these dirty things to enter into my house. I keep everything clean and neat. They love houses more than the souls of the people. And the Lord is saying, is the love you have that opens everything you've got. Gives everything of God so that souls can be saved. He said, by that do men know that you are my disciples. When you show that love one to another, you will do it. I will do it. And we will do it in Jesus' name. We're looking at First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. We're looking at verse 16. Hereby perceive with the love of God. Because he laid down his life for us. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And then he says, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And we ought to lay down, tell me, our lives for the brethren. And we ought to lay down what? Our lives for the brethren. Looks like, you know, uh, gone are the days when people can lay down their lives for the brethren, all brethren. Uh, you know how kind of tribalism is, you know, trying to sneak into the church. I'm of this tribe. I'll do anything for any member of the church who is of my tribe. I'm of this section. I'll do anything. I'll sacrifice anything for anybody in my section. I'm of this local assembly. I'll do anything, sacrifice anything for anybody in my local assembly. If the person we call deeper life, what's deeper life? Is coming from another location, is coming from another city, is coming from another town. Who cares? Since it's not from my tribe. But the Lord is saying that those who say they really love the Lord, holiness will generate love. Holiness will produce love. Holiness will show in the love that we have. It's not just by kind of, uh, somebody was giving testimony sometimes and he says, the, the pastor referring to the Jesus, he walks like this and puts his hand like this and then to be holy and sanctified and sanctimonious, I try to walk like that and put my hand the way the pastor puts his hand. Hey, that's not holiness. Holiness is love. Holiness is the attitude you have. Holiness is the lifestyle you have. Holiness is what helps you. 
It's not just, you know, the way we walk, the way we put down our heads, or the way we look up, or the way we sing, or the way we do anything. I try to study the pastor. And then I try to do exactly as he's doing. You can do that without prayer, without repentance, without grace, without sanctification. Anybody can copy another person. We're talking about the sin that gets you to heaven. And he's saying that we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We'll begin to do it now. And we'll do it right. We'll be able to sacrifice. You know, some people, all they try to copy is how I stand, how I walk, how I put my hand, where I put my hand. That's what they copy. They don't copy my sacrifice, my sanctification. They don't copy my lifestyle. They don't copy my commitment and consecration. They don't copy my going up and down to witness and to talk to other people. They don't copy my going to that place and preaching the gospel and going to that place and preaching the gospel. That's what you copy. They don't copy my self denial. All they want to copy is how I walk, how I stand, how I do that. That's nothing. The thing to copy is to lay down your very life for the brethren. We'll do it in Jesus' name. And then it says in verse 17, but whoso has this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God. God in him. My little children let us not love in word neither in tongue but in deed and in truth. We'll do it in Jesus name. When he saves us, he calls us to save other people. He saves us and he calls us to go and preach that word to other people. That's the love. That's the love. He wants us to show to others in Second Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This revelation of God is spiritual and practical and applicable to all people in every generation. That is this uh, doctrine of love and this practice of love. That's what he wants us to do. The will of God as sanctification is not to be despised and the word of God, the divine teaching is not to be disregarded as the believer is to have a clean body free from the fleshly laws. He is also to have a cleansed heart full of fervent love for the brethren. The Thessalonians praise the Lord at an unshakable conviction about their love toward one another because they were taught of God to love one another. Their love for the brethren was stronger than the affection for blood relatives. The love manifested among them was characteristic of the divine nature. It had no stain of selfish motives, no stain of carnal desires, no stain of hidden ambition or subtle pursuit of worldly gain. They were noble in their love, manifesting the God kind of love, a divinely touched love towards all the brethren. They demonstrated merciful acts of kindness and generous hospitality tenderness and compassion were sacrificial deeds of service though exemplary in their love they were now being encouraged to abound and excel in love more and more and when you excel in love here is what you are going to do the lord is showing us look at it now in second corinthians chapter 5 we're reading from verse 17 therefore if any man be in christ tell me the rest he is a new creature old things are passed away Old things are passed away. Uh, have you noticed uh, old things? They, they used to, it's like, old things like to creep back, sneak back into your life. Uh, let's say, for example, before you were born again, your old lifestyle. Anytime anybody says something you don't like, then you get angry, you squeeze your face, you frown, you withdraw, you become quiet, you cannot talk to anybody anymore. You're sorrowful and sad until the person that says something you don't like, until they come to kneel down, prostrate, and beg. And then little by little, you begin to open up and cheer up a little bit. And then when they say some things funny, you don't smile. And then afterwards, after they have, you know, they've done everything and give you peppermint and give you sugar and give you toy, then you smile a little bit. That was the old life. Now you say you are born again. That kind of old thing is still there, sneaking back into your life. 
that any time somebody says something you don't appreciate, you don't like, again, you withdraw, again, you are quiet, again, until somebody comes to kneel down, to beg, and to prostrate, until they give some toys before you smile again. He says, come on. If you are born again, if you are in Christ Jesus, you are a new creature. Old things are what? Passed away. And he says, behold, behold, all things have become new. That newness of life is what God is expecting. That's what is called holiness. The newness of life will come upon us. But look at this now. Immediately there is that change. Immediately there is that conversion. Immediately there is that holiness and sanctification. Look at verse 18. And all things of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation to which that is to say that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation is telling us that we are reconciled with God, we are born again, we are saved, our lives are turned around and then we touch the lives of other people and then we reconcile them unto God. We go out to a witness, we win souls and we bring them unto the Lord. In verse 20 now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled unto God. That brings us to the evangelism we've been talking Talking about that after we have turned to the Lord, then we turn other people to the Lord. After we get saved, we help other people to know the way of salvation and bring them into that salvation. After all, our sins are forgiven, we have the peace of God and that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We ourselves will turn around to help other people how they too can be born again. My question to you is, are you doing that? Are you reconciling men unto God? Or do you just come for Bible study I'm saved, praise the Lord. I'm sanctified, praise the Lord. I'm on my way to heaven, praise the Lord. Your mother, is she born again? Is she saved? Your father, is he born again? Is he saved? Your children, are they really born again? I'm not asking whether they go to church or not. I'm saying, are they saved? Are they born again? Do they know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior? Your co-workers and your co-tenants, and the people that live around you, are they born again? Are they saved? Or do you just, you know, come into the church and come with the big Bible and read the Bible, and you never tell anybody else? It says the Lord has given us the ministry of reconciliation to be able to tell other people they ought to be born again. Or you just say, well, I don't have time to tell other people I've been born again because I'm a worker in the church, and because I'm a worker in the church, I spend all my time in the church, and because of that, I don't have the time to even get in touch or get in contact with all those people outside. Well, your condemnation will be very great because we too are workers in the church before we came to you to preach to you. Before we brought you into the kingdom. If we didn't go out, those of us that started over here. And we love the Lord. We just stayed in the church. And we just stayed in whatever little thing we were doing in the church every time. And we never went out to talk to people. How would you have been saved? Other people got it to you. Get it to other people. It's like many people fell into the well. About ten people they were in the well. And then they were crying and shouting. And then somebody came from outside. And he threw down a cord. And he said catch it. And you were the one that caught that cord. And then he pulled you up. And wind you up. And then he got all the dirty water out of you. And pumped all the dirty water out of your stomach. And now you are alive. And then he gave you. He said I've got you. How many people are still remaining there? Nine people are remaining there. You are hearing their cry and he gave you the rope and went away and then you are too busy with the rope and you are rejoicing and all those people are dying there and God will require their blood at your hand. Use that rope. And the rope is that evangelism that the other people that are still there in the well, you'll get them out like somebody got you out. Don't say you're so busy in the church, you can't reach out to the people around you. I'm looking at Luke chapter 10. 
Luke chapter 10, see what the Lord is telling us to do because he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. After we are saved, after we are sanctified, after he purifies our heart, after he makes us holy, the purpose of holiness is so we show love. And we show love to people in the church and people outside the church. In fact, we have more people outside the church than inside the church. In Luke chapter 10, I'm reading there from verse 27. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. The Lord is saying that you have love. Praise the Lord for your love, for your love for the brethren. But let it increase more and more. It tells us then in verse 28, And he said unto him, the Lord Jesus said unto this man, Thou hast answered right this due, and thou shalt live. In verse 29, But he willing to justify himself, saith unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. That's talking about church leaders. That's talking about priests. That's talking about preachers. That's talking about the people that do a lot of sacrifice in the synagogue, in the temple, in the church. They've done all their duty in the church and now they're going back home. And while they're going back home, they think that service in the church, that's all. Responsibility in the church, that's all. Duty in the church, that's all. And once we were preached in the church, that's all. And while they were going, then they saw this fellow that is left half dead. And as they looked, oh, it's not a member of our church, it's a stranger, and then passed on the other side. That shows the understanding of the man. He thinks it's only religion, not life. And that life was dying right there. And the Lord is speaking to us. That's your neighbor. Go and do something. And get the word of life and the bread of life unto them. And show them how they will know the Lord. When you see the people around you. They are dying. They are dying in sin. And they are left half dead. Yes, they go to church. They go to synagogue. They go to temple. They go everywhere. Go tell them that they need to be born again. So that you can bring them to life. Don't do it like this priest that will just look and then pass by. I pray that God will give us the heart of compassion, the mind of compassion in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen if you are listening. Amen. Look at verse 32. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at that place, a Levite, you know the Levites, those are the people that carry the instruments of the temple and the instruments of the place of worship. You know, they're so busy in the church. I'm busy in the church. I'm here. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And that's all their joy. That's all their testimony. And this Levite also, he looked on him and passed by on the other side. The Lord is telling us that if all you do is just, you know, all these uh, things to do, church maintainers, ministry maintainers, and Christian maintainers, religious maintainers, and you don't touch the lives of the people outside, they're living with you. They're schooling with you. They're working with you. They do not know the Lord. And all you think you can do is, you know, we're so busy on Sunday, like I've been emphasizing to the church, we're busy with this and this and this. And when those sinners and those neighbors are free for us to talk to them and preach the word of salvation to them, we're never there. The Lord is saying, great will be a condemnation. I pray God will open your eyes. And then he'll jerk you up into action to talk to the people that need to be born again in Jesus' name. And now we're told about a certain Samaritan as he journeyed. This one was not a worker in any temple, a worker in any synagogue. You know there are some people that they say, I'm not a worker, therefore they cannot be soul winners. I'm not a worker, therefore they cannot witness to other people. This Samaritan then came and as he came where he was and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. That's the evidence of knowing the Lord. That love, that kindness, that compassion, that mercy. That's the evidence that we really know the Lord. When Christ himself, he puts his compassion in your heart. When God puts his love, his mercy in your heart, he had compassion on him and he went to him and he bound up his wounds. 
pouring in oil and wine and he set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him he took care of him you are going to take care of people around you I said you'll take care of people around you. You know there are some people, if their neighbors are sick, if their co-tenants are sick, they won't even go there. They won't even uh, try to give a cup of cold water, except they bring a big Bible and they say, I'll pray for you in the name of Jesus. This man was not just praying for the man. He took care of him. Take care of your neighbors. Take care of the people around you. And we call it friendship evangelism. Touch the lives of other people. We call it servant evangelism. That is, you're serving other people. And because you're serving them, they become so grateful. They say, how did he do this for me? I think I'm going to follow him to his church. How did he do this for me? When I didn't even expect, even my own relatives and my friends and the people that I'm even helping, they didn't even come near me. But this man, this deeper life man, this deeper life woman, just help me like this. That's when people will open up to the gospel. I pray God will give us wisdom. That this kind of kindness and mercy and compassion, touching the lives of other people, he gives to every one of us in Jesus' name. And then he says in verse 35, And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pens and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, take care of him, take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. That's laying down your substance to take care of other people. And when you do that for people, people you don't know, people in the market, people on the street, people who are living in the same house with you, people in the same school with you, when you do that for them, they will listen to you. Whatever you are preaching after that time, they will want to listen. And then it says, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, tell me, say it well go and do thou likewise we're going to do that in jesus name that's the evidence we're saved that's the evidence we're sanctified you know theoretical sanctification will not take us to heaven it's practical sanctification that will take us to heaven the theory you know i'm saved i'm sanctified all these theoretical testimonies we give on thursday on friday in our churches theoretical salvation theoretical sanctification never gets anybody anywhere it's a practical salvation the practical sanctification that takes us to heaven and i pray that the grace of God will work more and more in your life, in my life, in our lives in Jesus name. We come to number three now, glorious uncompromising commitment to honesty. Glorious uncompromising commitment to honesty. Now the Lord is telling us that as a result of the holiness, as a result of the sanctification, number one there is love number two there is honesty you cannot say you are sanctified if you are not honest if you are dubious if you are fraudulent, if you are cheat, if you are stealing, if you are kind of defrauding other people, you cannot say you are sanctified. It is when you have this evidence in your life, the practical things that the Lord is talking about here, this is the evidence of real sanctification, not the one the people tell in theory. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're reading from verses 11 and 12, and that he told you to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. It says the Lord has called us not to laziness, not to idleness. The Lord has called us not to uncleanness. Idle hands will be used of the devil. The devil finds work for idle hands. There will be tail bearers. There will be gossips. And there will be the people that you know, your flesh will be you know, demanding for this and that. If you're a lazy man, if you're a lazy woman, your minds will be running here and there. It will be running to evil. But it says, get quiet and get busy. Don't be lazy, but be busy. It says that you study that you endeavor to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. In verse 12, it says that she may walk honestly toward them that are without and that she may have lack of nothing. That she may have lack of nothing. You know, it surprises you the way people practice religion nowadays. 
And how do they think they're going to have lack of nothing by giving, giving money to the prophet, giving money to the preacher, and the preachers, that's what they're emphasizing. They don't emphasize for the people to do legitimate work. They say, if you want to be rich, if you want to be prosperous, I tell you what to do. So, you sow into the pastor's life. You sow into the pastor's family. And when you give and give and give like that, and, and they so talk to them and brainwash them that they go to take all their money, their capital, they should put in business, they come to give it to the pastor. They come to give it to their overseer. And they say, I've sown that, and then they remain poor. And then they say, oh, it's because you are not pray. You must pray. They pray and fast and pray and fast so that they'll be prospered. And the Lord is saying that the way the prosperity comes is not by praying and fasting. The way the prosperity comes is not by giving all your money, all your capital to a particular preacher, to an evangelist. It says that ye may walk your walk honestly toward them that are without, that you may have lack of nothing. Walk with your hand. We're going to walk. I said we're going to walk. And you know some people that do not read their Bibles, sometimes they will leave our church here and they are roaming about to all these places where they are inviting them to come and give their money. And their tithes and offering they will not pay here when the man over there, when he comes out and he says today is a day of prosperity. And he says everybody shout hallelujah, shout amen and today God will prosper you. I'm telling you look out there if you don't have any car there, by the time you come next time you are going to have your vehicle and they clap and shout and they say praise the lord prosperity has come you'll be head and you will not be tail shout amen and the people shout amen and some of you are there shouting amen too and then they say now i'm going to show you the way how god will prosper you you want to become a millionaire this is the quickest way to become a millionaire. Everything you have there. I'm not talking of 5,000, 10,000. I'm not talking of 20,000. Everything you have inside, uh, you have there. If you don't have it there, you have your checkbook there. Write it there. And then we're not going to do any secret something. You come on here and you're filing here and run here very quickly. The first person that comes here will be a millionaire. And then those people, they put everything they've got, they put it down. I pity those people ignorant people and that man will carry all their money and go and he himself is not working a lazy prophet only trying to deceive the people and get him their money if you are going to get rich you will work i said you will work and then it says over here you'll be quiet and do your own business and when you do your business god will bless your work it blesses the work of your hand. It doesn't bless laziness. It doesn't bless idleness. You know, some people that are trying to sell prayer they want to become rich by selling prayer. All the prayers we have been praying for you over here, did we get money from you? Tell me out loud. No. Freely you have received, freely give. But the Lord is telling us to walk. We'll keep on walking. I say, you will keep on walking. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm reading to you from verse 10. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. Holiness generates work, hard work. You know, some people are so holy and so sanctimonious and so sanctified that you know I cannot work anymore. My friend, why are you at home at 10 o'clock in the morning? Oh, because you know, Pastor, before I got sanctified, I used to work in the factory. I used to work there. I used to work, but now since I got sanctified, God told me if I'm going to keep my sanctification, I must leave all those people. I'm not going to work. How are you going to eat? God said He will provide. <laughs> you will die of hunger. I pray God will wake you up. Go back to that factory and go and get work. And walk with your hand. I will walk with my hand. I said I will walk with my hand. You know you hear the message today. Tomorrow you will not be lazy. Amen. Give me a good good amen. amen. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 10. For even when we were with you. This we commanded you. That if any man would not work. What will happen? Now that should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, walking not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort that by our Lord Jesus Christ, this commandment is coming from who? 
from Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Work. We're going to work. We're looking at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I read there from verse 11. Romans chapter 12 verse 11. It says, Be not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You know, doing your business doesn't hinder you serving the Lord. You are not slothful in business. And then it says, you are fervent in spirit. Do whatever you are doing with some fervency, enthusiasm, and get to work. And then it says, over here in verse 11, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessities of the saints, giving to hospitality. You shouldn't be a beggar. You should be giving to other people. Giving to the necessities of other people. Look at verse 17. It says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, we're reading from verse 10. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, Whatsoever, what? Thy hand. Your hand must find something to do. Whatsoever your hand finds to do, it says, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Whatever your hand finds to do. If you don't find office job, find market job. If you don't have market job, find work in your community. Get something done. That you are helping other A lot of things you can do. A lot of things you can do. See what other people are doing. If you have gone to school, you have graduated, but there's no office job, no white collar job, get something doing. And when you do that, then a better thing will come later in Jesus' name. But you know, if you just fold your hand and then you are a beggar, saved, but a beggar, sanctified, but a beggar, and then other people have to be feeding you, how can that be? It's saying that whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might and do it with all your strength. Because here is the time of walking. We're going to walk. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 28. It tells us there, Let him that stole, let that be of the past, steal no more in the present. But rather, let him labor, walking with his hands, the thing that is good. That then it says that he may have to do what? To give to him that needeth. It means now that you're a real child of God, born again, saved and sanctified, you shouldn't be getting from people, begging people, receiving from people. You should work with your hands so you'll have enough for yourself, enough for your family, and then to give to them or to him that needeth. The Lord has taught us and we're going to follow this teaching. And we're going to walk honestly. We're going to love. And we're going to manifest honesty everywhere in Jesus' name. We're coming back to your first Thessalonians now. First Thessalonians, I'm reading there from chapter 4, verse 7. What the Lord has taught us today. And the emphasis he has given us. And then the life we ought to live. It says, for God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. We're going to personalize it before we pray. I'm going to read it and then you read it after I've read it. Wait, let me read. For God has not called me unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Everybody put me there once you go. Read that very well. Read that again yourself. For God has not called me unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despises, you know, some people may despise you because you are holy, because you are sanctified, because you are preaching it, because you are singing it, because you are living it out. And it's, ah, holy, holy, holy Enoch, holy Peter, holy Mary. holy Elizabeth. Don't worry about that. Those who despise, they're not despising you. They don't despise members of deeper life. 
They are not despising preachers in deeper life. He therefore that despises, despises not man, but God, who has also given me his Holy Spirit. He has given you the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit will work out that holiness and righteousness in your life in Jesus' name. And in fact, you do it toward all the brethren, which are, it says, uh, be as touching brotherly love. You don't have any need that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. You are going out of this place understanding that now you are going to show love unto people around you, members of the church, those who are not members of the church practical love, not theoretical love. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia. Then it says, but we beseech you, brethren, that she increase more and more. If your love has only been to people of your tribe and people of your household, if your love has only been to the people of your denomination, if your love has only been to the people of your household, go beyond that. Your neighbors are there, your co-workers are there, your co-tenants are there. The street Strangers are there. The people on the street, they are there. Jesus died for them. The greatest love you can show to them is to preach the gospel unto them. Go and do it. And that she study to, to be quiet and to do your own business and to walk with your own hands as we commanded you. That ye may walk honestly, I will be honest. I said I will be honest. That she will walk honestly toward them that are without and that she will have lack of of nothing. I pray that God will make every one of us doers of his word in Jesus name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has taught us quite a lot, quite a lot, quite a lot and he wants us to seriously honestly, practically take it to the Lord in prayer and say Lord yes I've heard I'm going to do what the Lord has said the Lord has called you not unto uncleanness, not unto defilement not unto argument and he has called you not unto debate, he has has called you unto holiness. Accept that holiness, receive that holiness, live in that holiness, rejoice in that holiness, and live it out in a practical way. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. He saved us so we can be instrumental to saving other people. We are reconciled unto God so we can be instruments of reconciliation for other people. He wants us to touch the lives of others. Bless the lives of others. Bring others into the kingdom. He called us out of the world. Out of the defilement. Out of the sin. Out of the evil. Called us out of the uncleanness. But he's sending us back there to go and tell the people how we became free. How they too can be free. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And as the Father has sent me into the world, so have I sent them into the world. He called you out of sin. And he wants you to be an instrument of calling others out of sin. Evangelizing. Telling the people, telling the lost. How do you come to know the Lord? Go and do it. Go and do thou likewise. Holiness, that's the nature of God. Holiness, that's the character of God. Holiness, that's the will of God. Holiness, that's the purpose why Christ came into the world. Holiness, that's why the Lord called you by the preaching of the gospel. And except you are saved, except you are free from sin, except you are holy, the purpose of the Lord calling you has not been fulfilled. But you are telling the Lord, Oh Lord, I come. Oh Lord, I come. Cleanse me. Wash me. Purge me. Purify me. I know the call of God to holiness is unchanging. Unchangeable. From the original time to this present time, that calling is still there. He called Enoch, Enoch responded. He called Noah, Noah responded. He called Abraham, Abraham responded. He called Moses, Moses responded. And now he's calling you. Are you going to be different? Are you going to respond like Enoch, like Abraham, like Noah, like Moses, like Peter, like Paul, like the rest of them? Saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. 
I've had your call. A high calling. A holy calling. A heavenly calling. That the calling is given unto you. And as you respond to that call, he'll cleanse you, wash you, purge you, purify you, sanctify you, make you holy. Then you'll hear his voice telling you, be holy for I am holy. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to your former lust, your ignorance, but now as he who has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, for it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. But remember, that holiness will produce something in your life. Remember that holiness, not theoretical holiness, practical holiness, will produce, generate love in your heart. Love towards God. Loving God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. That's what the holiness will produce. You'll delight in the will of God. You'll delight in loving God, serving God, cleaving unto God. Delighting in God. And he who loves God will love his neighbor also. He who loves God will love his brother also. He who loves God will love his wife also. He who loves God will love her husband also. He who loves God will love his parents also. Love his children also. And the greatest manifestation of love is to save them from eternal destruction. Save them from eternal ruin. Save them from eternal perdition. You'll preach the good news to them. You'll tell them of the love of God that sent Jesus Christ to die for us on the cross of Calvary. That's love. That's love. Just giving bread. That's not enough. If you don't show them the way of salvation, that bread they will eat and they go to the toilet and that's over. But life eternal. Life everlasting. Salvation eternal. Conversion. That takes a man from earth to heaven. You know the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Tell your neighbors. Tell your co-tenants. Tell everybody around. That Jesus is the way to life eternal. It's as you do that. You'll be showing and demonstrating the love of God. And it is that kind of love the Lord is expecting that will come out of the holiness you profess, out of the holiness you possess. You are telling them you won't allow them to get lost, to perish. Go tell them, tell them of the love of God that sent Jesus Christ to die for them on the cross of Calvary so they will not be lost. I'm sure you don't love property more than life. You don't want to show that you love money more than life. You don't want to show that you love position in the church more than life. Life eternal. Life of Christ in man. The life that draws them out of sin into salvation. Appreciate that love. Appreciate that life. Love people. Have compassion on them. Be kind unto them. And show them the way that leads to life eternal. Be the good Samaritan. Be the good Samaritan. Don't be like that priest. I've done everything I can do in the synagogue. I've done everything I can do in the temple. I've done everything I can do in the place of worship. And you see the people going from Jerusalem to Jericho. They've lost their lives, eternal life. They're backsliding, they're half dead. Have compassion on them. Reach out to them. Show them the love of Christ. 
show them they don't have to perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on the Lord Jesus Christ will not perish but have life everlasting. Show them they don't have to die in sin. They don't have to perish. They don't have to be lost. They can be saved. If you consecrate your life, your time, your treasure, everything you've got to telling them the way of the Lord. Then your school, your schooling together, tell them. Then your market, your trading together, tell them. Then your working place, working together, tell them. Somebody else told you. Tell them. They can be saved. Tell them lovingly. Tell them gently. Tell them passionately. With great compassion. Tell them tenderly. Tell them with the love of God. So they don't have to be lost. And be all things to all people. And be all things to all people. That's why you came. That's why you came to learn. Learn and do. Don't just keep it in the head. Transfer it to your heart. Let it bring up kindness, mercy, compassion, love in your heart. Let holiness produce love. Let the love increase more and more, more and more, more and more. Honesty. Walk with your hand. Don't be a beggar. Believers are not beggars. Don't be lazy. Real believers are not lazy. Conversion brings transformation. And that transformation takes away laziness from us. Get busy. Whatsoever your hand finds to do. Legitimate work. Don't do something illegal. Don't do something legitimate. Something legal. Something legitimate. Something profitable. Something productive. Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all your mind, all your strength, with everything you've got. Work in a legitimate way, legitimate place. And you're living. Don't live on stealing. Don't live on begging. Don't live by fraud. Be honest. Work honestly. And while you are working in the place of work, remain holy. Remain righteous. Remain pure. Because the Lord can come anytime, day or night. And remember, follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man holiness without which no minister holiness without which no church worker holiness without which no member of the church can see the Lord follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord